My name is Allison. My name is Allison O'Connor and I'm with CSU Extension in Larimer County. I'm a horticulture specialist and I've been with Extension for 19 years, which is shocking and hard to believe and hard to say, honestly. Um, but I have a great job. I get to help people with plant selection. I work with the industry and I coordinate the Master Gardener program up here in Larimer County. So really excited to have you here. Um, as Melanie mentioned, this webinar will be recorded and the slides will also be provided to you who are attending tonight. Uh, so you'll get a copy of these slides. So don't feel like you need to take frantic notes. Uh, you can have those. And then my email address is on this slide. It will also be on the last slide of the presentation. Please, if we don't get to your question or you need clarification, don't hesitate to email me or reach out. I will happily respond and support you as I need to. I do have to say and let you know that CSU is an equal opportunity access and non-discrimination university. So if there's anything we can do to accommodate your needs or make things better, please let me know. Also visit the website that's listed at the bottom uh, for more information. So diving right in, let's talk about gardening and landscaping in Colorado, because it really does seem to be an act of sheer will and strength. So today, actually this week, we have had beautiful weather. In the 60s, it was pretty calm. We got over that hump of the terrible wind that we had over the weekend. Um, and coming in tomorrow, we have a front coming in. So I'm up north, up in uh, the Fort Collins, Windsor area. And so we are expected to get one to four inches of snow. So this is what happens to us is that we have these beautiful warm days and then we get snow and then it's beautiful and warm again. And so it just takes a lot. If you have moved to Colorado from another part of the world or the country, uh, gardening here can be very different and very challenging. Uh, so the fact that you're here tonight, the fact that you're interested in learning more about plants that do well, kudos to you, um, but really a lot, a lot of gardening is trial and error. Uh, so just know that and be patient, um, you know, learn from your mistakes, learn from your failures and talk to people that have been here a while or that have more experience that can also be resources to you. Extension is one of those resources. We have lots of different offices across the state of Colorado. Every county in Colorado is served by Extension. And so don't hesitate to reach out. That's what we do. We want to make sure that you are successful as a gardener. A little bit more about Colorado and the water situation that we're in. We are a semi-arid state. And so I moved here from Ohio last. I grew up in Minnesota. Both of those states have a lot more precipitation uh, than what we have here in Colorado with only eight to 15 inches a year. Um, a lot of that does come from snow and March tends to be our wettest month. So far, it doesn't look promising, but again, we don't know what's lying ahead. Uh, so hopefully we get some moisture because for the most part, depending on where you live, it's been a fairly dry winter and fall so far. Um, word is out that Colorado is a great place to live. I can't argue with that. It is an amazing place. But as we get more populations uh, settling into Colorado and deciding to move here, all of that population growth then puts an increased pressure on our already limited water supply. So this is where we need to be a little more conscious about our water use. Um, if you are a homeowner and you get a regular water bill, you've probably already been notified by your water district that rates are likely going up for 2024. I just got that bill in the mail or that notice. Um, and so you can really save a lot of water by planning your landscape, focusing on sustainable, focusing on water-wise practices, watering appropriately, and then plant selection, which is what we'll focus on tonight, is a huge part of that. Um, you may have heard this statistic. So while overall landscape water use, all of the water, if we take all of the water in Colorado and we look at what is used for landscapes, which includes golf courses and parks in our backyards and all of those areas, that's only about 3% of our total water in the state of Colorado. However, during summer months, landscape watering, so this includes your turf and your vegetables and your annuals and your perennials, 
that can account for about 50% of your household water budget in the summer. So obviously you've noticed that in the winter months, you're not using as much water because in the summer you're doing activities outside or you're growing additional plants outside. So we know that water is expensive and it's up to us to use it wisely. We are all money conscious. We are all um, trying to make sure that we budget accordingly. And so again, focusing on those Zurich and WaterWise practices can help save you money, which is a really good thing. Um, and it doesn't mean that you have to live without. Um, WaterWise landscaping does include turf grass. It can include areas for your children to play. And so we can have a beautiful landscape that's full of flowers that attracts pollinators, a place for the kids and dogs. We can have all of that, but we need to think about it in a more water wise way. So it is great. Um, in the last several years, Coloradoans have really um, made about, have saved about 20% of overall water use uh, when it comes to our household water use, which is awesome. Um, and that's making those simple changes. So low flow shower heads and changing out toilets to be more efficient or having high efficiency washers and dishwashers, that kind of thing. Those changes all add up. Um, and when it comes to landscaping, it's not really hard to make small changes that can really result in significant water, not only for um, how much water you're using, but also for your, your money that you're spending. Um, so one tip, this is one tip that I like to share with everyone. I just talked about this this morning. Um, this spring, when you fire up your irrigation system, whether it's your drip irrigation or your lawn irrigation, just take your total runtime from last year and save off 10%. So if you are running your zones for 20 minutes, just set them for 18. That will save you 10% over the season of your total water that you're actually using. Really, really easy to do um, and can result in significant water savings. And that's amazing. You will not notice, I promise you will not notice a difference in plant quality or water uh, quality, but you'll notice that on your bill. So look at the gallons you're using, shave off that 10%, maybe stretch it to 20 if you're willing, um, and then also learn how to operate your clocks and irrigation. If we have another wet spring like we did in 2023, we really didn't need to turn on our irrigation until probably late May or June based on the amount of water that we were getting from Mother Nature. So just be conscious about those things. Easy fix. If you don't know how to run a clock, ask a friend, look at the online manual. Um, but again, try to do that 10%. Um, how it affects you uh, this year. It's also important to design your garden with water in mind. And so a lot of us moved into an existing home. I'm one of those. My house was built in the mid 80s. And I, I moved into a landscape that was established. And so over the years, as we've lived here, we've made some small changes. So swapped out irrigation heads, replanted some things that didn't make it or maybe became overgrown. And that's what you can start to do. So the Garden in a Box program from Resource Central is incredible. Uh, they have amazing, not only designs, and so if you're puzzled by how plants go together or what looks good, they've taken that guesswork out. Plus, they put these plants together that really do serve an amazing purpose, with color, attracting pollinators, and all of those things. So do look on their website. Um, a lot of water districts are participating with Resource Central to offer discounts to water customers. I'm really proud to see that Windsor is one of those this year, which is amazing. Um, but you get so many cool plants, and I've looked at some of the, the options of plants. They might be plants that you couldn't find typically in garden centers. And so definitely check those out. But design is really important. And again, um, you can use resources that can help you with that. When it comes to planting right plant, right place, we really need to think about this in, a, in kind of a, a really thoughtful way. Um, so we're looking at plants that are either adapted to Colorado's semi-arid climate, or we're looking at things that could be native or native vars, which are native plants, but then they've been selected uh, for ornamental purposes. Um, so selecting the right plants really helps you with maintenance. It helps you 
um, manage the yard and the landscape more appropriately. It will reduce the need for fertilizers and herbicides and those things. And so again, the plant that you're choosing and how you arrange them really can save you a lot of time and money, which is really, really good. And hydrozoning is so important. Uh, hydrozoning is basically grouping like plants with their water needs. Um, hopefully you're looking at this picture, which is real. This was a real thing that happened. This was down in Phoenix. Um, they planted the saguaros, which of course are cacti and they only need maybe an inch or two of precipitation a year. And they planted it in a lawn of tall fescue, which is a cool season turf, which of course has a much, much higher water use of about an inch a week and they put these two plants together and they're trying to water them. So this is the worst example of hydrozoning that I've ever seen in my entire life because there is no way that you can keep this landscape happy. There's no way that you could keep this landscape from always looking good. This was the day it was planted. So it looked good at the moment, um, but you're either going to overwater the, the cactus or you're going to underwater the turf. And when you look at this situation, what is the most important? To me, it's the cactus. The saguaros with their arms, they can be over 100 years old. Um, and so this was just a terrible design. This was terrible. So again, with hydrozoning, grouping like plants together by their water need is important. That's why we don't necessarily put our tomatoes and our peppers, which need a lot more water, right next to some of our native plants different water needs. And so that's how you'll start looking at your landscape is those that use more routine water or regular water versus those that after they're established, maybe only need water once a month or rarely during the growing season. Maintenance, no plant is drought tolerant until it is established. So it doesn't matter if you're planting water wise plants or those from the plant select program or natives, they do need regular water in order to become established. And so this does mean that after you plant or if you purchase your garden in a box, and once you plant it in the ground, you do need to add water on a regular basis for at least this summer during the growing season. Now, it does depend on the type of plant, your soil, how much rain we get, the temperature um, of how much water you give. We don't have exact amounts, um, but I have seen many new uh, xeric landscapes that were either underwatered, so maybe watered once at planting and then left to the elements, or maybe overwatered where they were given too much water during that first growing season. We'd also encourage you to use the appropriate mulch. Uh, we won't cover that tonight. You can use wood mulch, you could use squeegee, which is basically crushed vines. They're kind of angular. They're maybe about a quarter inch in diameter, so they're smaller pieces, um, but that's often used as a mulch, especially for some of our water-wise and native plants. Uh, pea gravel, I think everyone is familiar with. They're rounded, um, tends to slip around a little bit more. So use an appropriate mulch that works for your situation. Um, and again, monitor those, those uh, moisture levels because you can still overwater even if you're using rock mulch. Um, pruning and maintenance, you know, that is really your prerogative. Um, I'm a lazy gardener when it comes in the fall. I'm kind of tired. I just want to watch football. And so I let a lot of things just kind of settle out over the winter months. And I'm now looking at my landscape, realizing uh, that I need to get out there and do some cleanup. Um, and then you can have the choice if you want things to reseed. Um, a lot of the cone flowers will naturally reseed columbines, the hyssops, um, the sedums. They don't reseed, but they replant themselves. Um, and you can decide how much of that you want based on your maintenance levels. Um, I have regrets of letting some of my cone flowers go to seed because now I have cone flowers growing everywhere. For some, that might be a joy. For me, it's kind of a pain. Um, so do decide how you're going to maintain. You might just like a more prairie look and um, I embrace you for that. So some resources you can consider. Um, again, you can uh, get the, this information when the slides are sent, but just know that CSU Extension is a resource. We have tons of information probably too much information. Uh, we also have the cohorts blog. You can check that out. Not only are there blog articles, it's also where we post some of our upcoming webinars and classes. 
The Plant Select Program is a cooperation uh, between CSU, Denver Botanic Gardens, and the Green Industries of Colorado. The purpose is to release plants uh, that do well in Colorado. So they have some great perennials, they have some shrubs and also some trees. I'll cover quite a few of those tonight, but that website is plantselect.org. Uh, the Front Range Tree Recommendation List has just been updated and it's my hope that it will come out any day. So we started this project back in 2010 and it was fully revised this year in 2024. So that does list trees. We have a new column for that list that does indicate if the tree is a native, but also gives some pros and cons of the tree itself. And then we do do trials up at CSU every year. So we have perennial trials, um, we have arboretum trials, and then you're looking at the annual flower trials. Um, so that information is on that website. So no shortage of information available to you. And then of course, Resource, Resource Central with a lot of their great tips as well. Going to Plant Select, I mentioned what this program is. And so these are plants that are released. They are actually trialed across the state and in the region. And then they have a really great website. So again, if you struggle with design or you're not sure how plants go together or how many plants you should put in a place, um, they do have design. So on their website, this design tab can lead you into several designs that have been created by expert designers in our area. Um, another thing you can do is go to plants. And so each year, Plant Select comes out with a, um, a list of plants that they have released. So this year they have three or four different plants, um, one of which is an Arizona cypress. It's pretty cool, um, but you can look at those. But what's amazing also about this website under the plants tab is this find a plant feature. So if you're struggling with an area that you don't know what could grow there, you can actually select traits that you're looking for in a plant. And you can see all of those traits listed on the left-hand side. So in this case, I just selected attracts bees. So you're looking for a pollinator plant. Um, further down, you can talk about exposure. So maybe you have a partially shaded location. You could click that. And then it will actually identify the plants through plant select that will do well in that area. Um, back on the main page, you can look for cooperating garden centers that sell plant select plants. Um, these are plants that will not be available at box stores. Uh, so you do need to go to the independent garden centers. But it's a really helpful tool to get you ideas. You can click on the pictures. You can get an idea of what they're like, heights. Um, Spread, all of those things. So do use that tool as another resource for you. Okay, I'll pause there. Um, do we have any pressing questions before we talk plants? All right, let me just get my video. There we go. <laughs> um, yeah, I think you're gonna, oh, here, I don't know what's going on with my video, there we are. <laughs> um, I believe you'll probably cover a lot more of the specific in the next, chunk. So I'm going to hold off on some of the specific questions about um, deer resistance and rabbit resistant plants, and but that has come up quite a bit. Okay. Um, immediate question, is there a resource to get mulch for free or low cost? So there are, potentially your city or your town might have free mulch. It's going to be wood mulch and what it's what we call arborist chips. So it's either what they are chipping uh, based on tree care that they're doing in the town, or it could be sh like Christmas trees that they're chipping up. Um, but there are many towns that offer free mulch, but not the rock mulch that wouldn't be free. But any a lot of the wood mulches would be free. Okay, great. Um, is low maintenance one of the traits that we can filter for on what you were just showing? You know, I don't think so, because I would never say, um, so all plants are some maintenance, uh, but that's a great question. If it's a perennial and things like that, you know, the maintenance is pretty limited, maybe cutting it back in the spring, um, maybe doing um, some division if it gets out of um, the space it's allowed. Um, but really, for the most part, these would, I would consider a lot of those plants to be more low maintenance, um, especially xeric plants, native plants, they don't want to be pruned. And so it's really, something that you plant and then just leave, just leave them alone. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, let's see. Um, so yeah, I think I'll just put a plug for lots of questions around deer, rabbit, and Japanese beetle damage as you get into the plants. Okay. 
themselves. Um, and then let's see, we got one more. Um, how does one determine how much water to apply for new plants? I'm sure you'll have plenty of feedback about that. And I will just put a plug yeah. on the garden in a box. Thank you for plugging that, Allison. Um, we do provide a plant and care guide that comes with the plants there. But I guess the broader question, Allison, what would you recommend? Yeah, that's really difficult. So I would actually resort to your finger um, and poke your finger in if it's wet. I would not water if it's dry or seems really dry, then give it some water. You know, giving you exact amounts, that's what you become a little bit hyper-focused on. Um, and it really does depend on your site, your soils, um, and a lot of different things. So I would use more of kind of observation, um, look at plant characteristics, but again, use your your kind of intuitive sense and uh, a finger to determine if it's water dry. Great. I love that because it is, it can also just vary so much based on conditions and everything too. Um, and last question, does a native garden um, typically still need an irrigation system once established, I would assume? That's a great question. And I think, you know, it, it depends. So I, I have a landscape that has no irrigation in my beds. I only have irrigation in my lawn and my vegetable garden. Um, so yes and no. Um, there would be times perhaps in, in times of really uh, extreme heat or extreme drought that you would want to water some of your natives. Um, is it worth it to have your irrigation system installed for that? Probably not when you could just drag a hose and sprinkler out. So I would let you make that decision. I would say, you know, it really depends on how extensive your landscape is and how much area you're trying to cover. But if you feel you can water adequately with just oh, putting your hose and sprinkler, you could probably skip the year. Awesome. Well, we can dive back in. And um, just a reminder that the slides will be provided. So the plant finder site um, that was mentioned a few slides ago will also be available there. Yes. Um, and as we go forward with the plants, I will try to mention if they're deer or rabbit resistant or Japanese beetle resistant, I will be, I will fully admit I cannot memorize everything about every plant. Um, and for the most part with your browsing mammals, with your deer, your rabbits and other things, if they're hungry enough, they're going to take a bite. Uh, so just be aware of that. So even if a plant is labeled as deer resistant, in some cases, it's not going to be. But I'll try to mention it if it comes up. <laughs> Thank you so much. And on the Garden in a Box info sheets, we do indicate the plants that are a little less tasty to deer and rabbit. But again, they will be eaten if they need to be. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, thank you. You're welcome. And I would say too, if you have browsing pressure, um, if you really want to keep your plants protected, that's where you do caging or exclusion. That is the number one thing is just to try to keep them out as best you can. Easier said than done. I absolutely agree and understand, uh, but you can also cage plants um, if that's an issue. Okay, so these are the three subjects we're going to cover going forward. We'll do some perennials, we'll do shrubs, and then we'll finish up with some trees that can actually do well in water-wise situations. Um, I do have to do a plug for spring blooming bulbs. So these are the bulbs that you plant in the fall and they are blooming now. I just noticed that my crocus are up and I don't think there's anything better than a happy little purple crocus or a yellow crocus in the spring. So spring blooming bulbs, I can't mention them tonight, but just know that these are great for the spring garden because they add so much color in a time of year right now where we are desperate for life and for something green and colorful. Uh, so again, these are bulbs like your daffodils and your tulips and your grape hyacinths and your snowdrops that you would plant in the fall and then they bloom now. The great thing about spring blooming bulbs is that after you plant them, you might water them once or twice, but then they're going to take all the moisture we get during the winter months. So the snow and the rain and things like that. And that's what they're going to use to force growth and then also bloom. So they're great to brighten up kind of shady spots, um, but definitely add some fall planted bulbs to your garden. They'll be available usually in September. You can get them at box stores, garden centers online. Um, and there's actually a number that are fairly water-wise, such as some of the species tulips, um, the daffodils are pretty good, and a lot of them hybridize as well. So they naturally form clumps as they mature. So spring bulbs can't say enough good things. But let's start with sun-loving perennials. So this section is going to cover those perennials that do well in hot, sunny locations. I have a section on shady perennials. So for those of you who have shade areas, don't worry, your section's coming up. Uh, but let's talk about those that love the sun. 
Just a little bit about perennial biology. These are plants that return from the crown or the ground year after year. We consider them to be herbaceous, so not woody. There's a couple crossovers in this group, but for the most part, these are more um, fleshy plants. So they have more of a green growth and they don't tend to get woody at the base like shrubs or trees. Um, they tend to have a set blooming time and the blooming time can vary from anywhere from a couple weeks to maybe a longer period of, you know, several months. Um, we have a lot of perennials that can bloom for a very long time. Um, most of the plants you get in Garden in a Box or all of the plants you'll get are going to be perennials. And so when you plant them, just remember the first year they're going to sleep. So you're going to plant them. They're going to be small. It's going to look kind of spaced out and you might be a little bit disappointed because we really want that instant effect from the landscape. So the first year they sleep, the second year they creep, which means they kind of start to grow, they'll get their roots going, and then the third year they leap. So it's really a three-year transition. So give yourself patience. Um, and perennials are very easy to overplant. So you might get a perennial in a four-inch pot, and you know it will say, oh, it will grow to 36 inches wide at maturity. Do respect the spacing on the perennials. Look at the mature width and look at the mature height to make sure that you're not cramming too much in a small space because you don't want to have to dig stuff up and move it in subsequent years. So give them space to grow um, and then also give them just a little bit of time as well. Our first perennial is one that is very familiar to you. This is iris. Everybody knows iris. I adore iris. It is hardy. It is Puff. It is resistant to most any sort of uh, soil that you give it, any sort of like, just toughest conditions an iris will grow. Uh, so we have Siberian iris, and then we also have the bearded iris, which is the one featured on the right. So it has kind of that fuzzy throat that actually leads the pollinators. Um, the most common iris we, color we see is probably purple. Uh, so if you have purple iris, I think they smell like grape jelly. I think it's great. They have a nice fragrance to them. Um, and then that really cool sword-like foliage. So they're starting to poke their heads up already. They're starting to be a couple inches above the ground. Um, they do have variegated iris, which I think is really nice as a contrast during the summer months. So you have variegated leaves of green and white, and then you have some that are just green. But the flower colors can range. Um, from white to pink to purple. Um, some of them are bicolored, so they might have two colors in the, in the flower. Um, just very, very tolerant. I think, you know, for the most part, I don't think you can go wrong planting iris. They are just super easy um, and really a great beginner perennial for a lot of different people. The next plant is penstemon, and there are so many wonderful penstemon out in our uh, garden centers. So penstemon, there are native varieties of penstemon that you can purchase. Um, and there are about 250 on the market. So you can go crazy. You could have a whole garden of penstemon if you were so inclined. Um, a lot of these are going to bloom from late spring through early summer. Um, they have different periods of bloom depending on the species. And so you might have some that are a little bit earlier, but the bloom on the plant will last at least a couple of weeks, if not more. So you'll get a long period of bloom. Uh, they do vary in height from one to three feet tall. And it really is important um, to remember that some penstemon are not going to be winter hardy. So this is where you do your research. This is where you buy from a reputable place. Um, so you know the actual species that you're trying to purchase so that it will overwinter successfully. Um, here's one for you rabbit and deer folks. They tend to be deer resistant, but again, if they're hungry, they'll probably munch. Um, and they do best in soils that you kind of neglect. So more in a gravelly soil, although mine are in full clay and they do quite well. Uh, but this is a plant that is not high maintenance. Once you get it planted and once it's established, just leave it alone. In the spring, cut it back uh, and it will do really well for you. So a full, full sun plant. Um, and then the one feature there is penstemon pinifolius. This is the pine leaf penstemon um, and it's great, maybe two feet tall at maturity. 
Plant Select has actually introduced a number of Penstem and they have several, at least a half a dozen or more. Um, here's two that I really like. The first is Carolyn's Hope. Uh, this is the, um, the flower itself is that breast cancer pink. So this was actually named after the breeder's wife, Carolyn, who was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, and I like this plant because a portion of the proceeds of this plant go into breast cancer research, which is really nice. But a beautiful plant, very, very well behaved. Um, you can plant them in a group. And again, that beautiful pink flower lasts for at least two to three weeks, if not more. Another penstemon, uh, this one's much larger. So we're talking about 20 to 24 inches tall. This is Coral Baby. Um, you can see how it's more of kind of that magenta pink or more of a, a red magenta pink. Um, another introduction from Plant Select back in 2015. And again, these plants are readily available. Um, they come in purples, they come in white. And so there's lots of different varieties for you. And again, the height ranges uh, so you can choose accordingly. The next plant is hummingbird trumpet, um, used to be called Zauchinaria, now called epilobium. I'm still gonna call it Zauchinaria because that's just how I learned it. Uh, this is a ground cover and it is beautiful. This is one of my absolute favorites. I have it planted in several parts of my yard. Um, the toughest place it's in is at the corner of the sidewalk and driveway. And so that it's facing west, it is full sun, you get the heat from the sidewalk in the driveway, and then this is where this plant is. The thing I love most about the hummingbird trumpet is A, it's orange. I love an orange flower, that's just me. Um, the fact that it attracts hummingbirds, and I've actually had hummingbirds in my yard, which is really exciting, but also the bloom time on this plant is basically from June until frost. All summer long, you're going to have these amazing, super floriferous, lots and lots and lots of flowers, uh, blooms on this plant. And again, it's a ground cover. Um, the way I maintain it, which may not be very kosher, but I do it anyway, is I mow it down. I actually take my lawnmower in the spring and set the blade a little bit lower and I mow it down and then it, it grows every year. Um, so very low maintenance for me. I love a low maintenance plant. Um, but a great, great ground cover, um, checks a lot of the boxes. Um, mine's in the front yard and I have some rabbit pressure and I have not noticed the rabbits eating this at all. So probably a good one for rabbit resistance as well. The next one is a Colorado native. This is chocolate flower um, for Landaria. And so chocolate flower, if you haven't met it, you will love it because it smells like chocolate. It really does, truly. And Honestly, it smells like Hershey's chocolate. Uh, so this is one that you want to plant near a doorway or a window where you're going to enjoy the fragrance. Don't put it in the back corner. Um, it's like some of the herbs, like the lavender that we're going to meet in a little bit, um, but a wonderful native plant. Now, here's the trick with chocolate flower is that it does not want to be looked at, touched or bothered once it's established. So give it its space. Um, it tends to reseed, um, but it will bloom. So this is one that if you are kind of a, a high maintenance, fussy gardener where you like to kind of dwaddle on things, this may not be the best plant for you. This is one for the person who thinks they don't have a green thumb, who might throw it in the ground and water it to get it established and then kind of forget it's there. That's the kind of plant this is. I have seen it growing in the worst locations. Uh, so on the CSU campus, um, it's kind of in this strip between a sidewalk and a building. There's some other kind of scrubby looking stuff there, but then there's this wonderful patch of chocolate flower. Um, so it's most fragrant in the morning. Um, it is wonderful. It doesn't, it's not going to be a stunner when you buy it at the garden center. It's not going to look like much. And that is something with a lot of our native plants. They don't look great in containers, but again, give it an opportunity to thrive um, and, and let it go. That The fragrance is incredible. Moving on to lavender, which is another really nice um, herbal plant that has great fragrance. Of course, you know lavender, so lavender can be used for many different purposes, medicinal and culinary and aromatic purposes. But really, as an herb, lavender is one of the best plants you can grow. Um, in terms of an ornamental, it is 
phenomenal because it is such a pollinator attractor. Loves, loves. Um, bees love it, both the honeybees and some of the natives as well. It also thrives in our alkaline soils. And so it's one that does better in higher pH. And then again, once it's established, it does really well. The trick with lavender, if you're going to grow it, I would plant it in the spring. It tends to have some issues with getting transplanted and getting established. Um, we will see dieback on lavender every single year without fail, but you can give it a hard prune. And what that means is you can cut it back basically to the ground um, and it should regrow from that point. But spring planted lavender is just going to do better. Now, in terms of varieties that you can grow, you'll want to focus on the ones that are English. So English lavender is going to be the most hardy, hardy to zone five-ish, so it should do well. Um, and if the name sounds English, it probably is English lavender. So names like Hidcote or Munstead or Mitchum's Gray, those are all English types. Sometimes you'll see lavender at box stores and it's Spanish or French and it has a much different flower head. Uh, those are not going to be hardy. So you can grow those as an annual, uh, but they're not going to overwinter in Colorado. There is one introduced by Plant Select called Wee One, and this is a perfect rock garden plant. So first of all, it's the cutest thing ever. It's only about eight to 10 inches tall, so it's like a dwarf lavender. Um, it does have parents that are English, and so it's very, very hardy. But if you're thinking of creating kind of a rock garden or maybe a crevice garden, this is such a great plant to tuck in. Uh, there's an incredible garden in Windsor called Treasure Island, and they have a crevice garden that they've built. And they have pockets of wee one planted, and it just is such an amazing color, and it blooms in July. Um, so you get really great pollinator benefits, and then you also get some really nice color from that as well. So we want is super cute. Um, they have a variegated lavender called Platinum Blonde. So the leaves are variegated, kind of a yellow green, purple flower. You can decide if you like that. Look it up. It's called Platinum Blonde. Um, and decide if you like that or not. Moving on to the sedums and the semps or the sempervirums. Um, these are our succulent friends. So these are the plants that have naturally fleshy leaves. Um, there's a lot of diversity to this plant group and so I can't cover it all, but just know in general, the sedums and the semps or the hens and chicks, that's what semps are, hens and chicks, incredibly diverse and very, very versatile. Uh, they can take a lot of good heat, they can take drought, um, and they vary in shape and size, which is really kind of fun. So you could have a lot of great planting potential with some of these plants. Um, they can tolerate poor soils. They do not like extra water. So again, once they're established and even during the establishment phase, you'll want to allow them to dry out. Kind of treat them almost like a cactus that you're growing indoors. So periodic water, uh, monitor them, let them get established. And once they're established, need very, very, very little supplemental irrigation. Um, the sedums will attract pollinators. They do have an interesting flower head, as do the sempervirums, or the hens and chicks. You can decide if you like the flowers or maybe they're detracting from the plant. I'll let you decide that. Uh, but a couple that you could consider is Angelina. Angelina has been around for a while. She is a ground cover sedum and she is gorgeous. So she has these incredible lime green leaves during the summer, almost a chartreuse color. So you could pair her with some maybe darker leaf plants or darker flowered plants, um, and she would put on a great show. Um, and then in the fall, she gets amazing fall colors, so kind of russets or oranges. And so I think a lot of times we look to trees for fall color, and we kind of forget that there's perennials that can fit that bill too. So lime green in the summer, kind of russet orange as the nights get cooler and we get a couple frosts. Um, but talk about a tolerant plant. This is one that if your friend has Angelina, you could literally go to their yard and pull up a fistful, ask them of course, and replant it and she will start to grow. She's very, very tolerant. Um, so Angelina sedum, very easy to grow, a wonderful ground cover, um, looks cool on a rock wall as you can see, so a lot of benefits to that one. 
One of the taller sedums is called Autumn Fire. You may have heard of Autumn Joy. They're kind of cousins, if you will. Um, these are great because they bloom later on into the fall. So they are putting on their blooms in August and September, and then they actually hold the flower structure during the winter months. And so it's kind of a flat top. These are great for late season pollination, um, but the, the flower itself is kind of flat top. So in the winter, when we get a snow, if you leave these standing, the snow actually gathers on top and it's a really cool photo opportunity. Um, but this one's taller, probably about knee high or so. There's another one called Frosty Morn that has a variegated leaf with kind of a lighter pink flower. Um, so a lot of great diversity in the sedums. So many ground cover sedums, but there's also taller ones too. Um, and again, full sun, rabbit resistant, does all of the things. And then I just want to call attention to the hens and chicks. There is a series that has been released called Chick Charms. And generally, I wouldn't call attention to a specific series of plants, but these are unique in the fact that it's the only one who's come out with this so far. So chick charms are widely available at your garden centers and there are so many different options available. So I just picked two, but just know there are probably a half a dozen or more available. So these are hardy hens and chicks. They all have diversity with variegation. So this one has kind of maroon tips and this one has chocolate tip, um, but lots of fun names and just diversity. So if you're not a super fan of the regular hens and chicks, just kind of the green hens and chicks. There is a ton of diversity that's coming out. And so rock gardens and succulent gardens have become all the rage. And so the industry has actually responded by introducing a lot of these different plants, which is super fun. Uh, a couple grasses that you can consider. This is Standing Ovation Little Blue Stem. This is a native var. So Little blue stem is a native grass to the eastern plains of Colorado. So if you go out to the Pawnee Buttes area, you will see a lot of little blue stem that is planted along with its cousin, big blue stem. And then standing ovation has been a selected cultivar of this for different purposes. Uh, this is a plant that is kind of a grayish green during the summer, but then it gets shades of purple or red during the fall months, which is amazing. So again, we had the sedums with some fall color, and then we have some ornamental grasses with fall color too. Um, they tend to remain upright during the winter months so that they don't, they don't lodge or fall over, which is also a nice benefit. So you can leave them standing during the winter months and then cut them back in the spring. Another option for little blue stem is blaze. And this one gets even more orange instead of red. This is like my favorite picture with this orange tabby and this amazing blaze little blue stem. Um, so a lot of these grasses have been introduced from the University of Minnesota. They have a good breeding program up there. So they're very, very cold hardy, um, probably to at least zone four, maybe zone three, and they just do really well. So blaze, standing ovation are two little blue stems. They could be about three feet tall, maybe a little taller with the seed head on it. Panicum or switchgrass. Uh, there's a lot of panicums out there, lots of diversity, not only in um, the, the foliage, but also a little bit in the size too. What I like about switchgrass is that it's a larger grass, but it's not on the largeness scale as miscanthus or maiden grass or pampas grass, which if you made the mistake of planting pampas grass, you know that you're in for a huge plant that is kind of hard to maintain. Um, so switchgrass is maybe four feet tall, maybe five with the seed head, um, but it's really well, it's well behaved. So it's stays in its clump, it doesn't grow too wide, um, and it just has a nice form to it. I really like it, very upright, um, and again, doesn't lodge during the winter months. Um, it can get really nice fall color, so um, you're looking at Shenandoah, that's the one behind here, um, and Shenandoah, as the, the nights cool down, will actually get flames of red coming in through the leaves itself. So green in the summer and then really a nice red color, kind of a, a red maple red that we all want. Um, heavy metal is over here on the right. So it's more of a gunmetal gray or blue, um, which is really nice. So a lot of really cool contrast there. 
Um, the seed head um, is more of a, I call it a fireworks or kind of cotton candy. So it's a little more airy and loose. Uh, Northwind was a switchgrass introduced by the University of Minnesota, again, through their ornamental grass breeding program for cold hardy. And again, look at that form, that nice, really shape. So, you know, if you're not interested in planting shrubs, you could plant a series of ornamental grasses as a barrier. You can see how there's a fence here um, as a nice kind of um, border for your, for your landscape, which could be really appealing. Uh, here's Shenandoah, so I mentioned how it gets those flames of red. Um, you can see here it's in the fall. We have some nice cone flowers that are blooming, and then we have these beautiful reds coming down um, during the fall months. Love Shenandoah. She is she's beautiful. All right, we'll move into perennials for dry shade, and then I'll stop for any other questions that we might have. Uh, so a few dry shade perennials, these are the ones that basically once they're established, you don't need to water much except in periods of extreme drought. So these are ones that probably do best in at least six hours of shade a day. Um, so under a tree or maybe on the north side of the house where you don't get a lot of sunlight, Morning sun is okay, but for the most part, these are going to thrive in more shady spots. Our first one is hellebores, also known as the Lenten rose, and hellebores have bloomed already. How cool is that? So they're named accordingly because they tend to bloom around Lent. Uh, this year they did bloom a bit earlier than that. So we saw some hellebores blooming in early February, um, which was unheard of. That was, that's crazy. Usually it's like mid-February through, um, you know, sometime in March. They can take full to partial shade. And what's really nice is that a lot of them are more of a muted, dusty color. So they kind of had more muted tones. They're not super bright. Um, they're great for early season pollinators, which is really nice. Um, the one downside with some of the hellebores is that when they flower, they tend to nod down. So you may not enjoy the flower as much, um, but there's a lot of different hellebores that have entered the market and CSU has done significant research on different varieties of hellebores and Merlin, uh, which is the one in the photo actually did very well in the perennial trials. They prefer a richer soil, but will do fine in clay as long as you give them some patience and time to get established. Uh, but again, they might need a little bit more moisture initially, and then you can start to wean that off. And they're going to bloom with what the moisture is as we get in the fall and winter. Uh, so they're going to bloom on that. Very cold hardy, very tolerant to a lot after they're established. The next one is Bleeding Heart. This is an old fashioned perennial and this is one of my favorites. Uh, this reminds me of my grandma who told me a story about the flowers. She took the flowers apart and each part meant something. Um, all I remember is that this is a rabbit or a bunny. You can see how it's sitting there with its ears back. Um, and then these parts, there were button hooks, a bottle of wine, and I'm not sure how it all related to each other with the rabbit, but there's a story there. Uh, we would consider Bleeding Heart to be an old fashioned perennial. It's been around forever um, and it loves early spring. Um, so it will it will throw up its uh, tubers. It's kind of tuberous. They're very thick and fleshy leaves first. Um, and this plant blooms generally in May and June. You'll get a couple weeks bloom out of it. And then when it gets hot, it just disappears. This is not a this is not a plant that will survive in 90 degree temperatures. Um, it has done its thing. It has flowered and it is happy to go dormant during those really hot months. Uh, so again, after this one's established, it lives on fall and winter moisture. It will bloom and then it will kind of disappear from the garden. So that's where you can plant something else to kind of mask where that gap in the landscape is. Um, but beautiful flowers in pink and white, and I just, I absolutely love Bleeding Heart. You could pair it with Columbine. I think everyone's familiar with Columbine as our state flower. Um, this is a great pollinator plant for some birds and also some uh, butterflies as well. Lots of different flower color variation, as you can see from the photo. The yellow is probably the most common. And then the Colorado state flower is the one that's yellow and purple or yellow and blue, depending on how you look at it. Uh, columbines do tend to reseed. And so if this is something that bothers you or you don't want, reseeding 
perennials in the garden, uh, maybe not plant columbine, but I wouldn't say it's aggressive or cumbersome in any way. Um, it's a gentle reseeder. And so you'll get little pockets of columbine where it finds a home. Um, deer resistant, drought resistant, and there have been a couple of selections from Plant Select. So the first is Denver Gold. Um, this is a little bit different than the, the yellow that you might be used to. It's more of a clear yellow. Um, and this was named, of course, for the city of Denver. So that's a beautiful columbine introduced from Plant Select. And then the second one is Remembrance. And so this was introduced shortly after the Columbine High shootings in remembrance of that tragic event. Um, very similar to our native Columbine that we see up in the mountains, um, but a really good landscape plant as well. So a lot of diversity to Columbine do great in the shade. Um, they can take some morning sun, uh, but really do well in shady conditions. Coral bells. <laughs> Saying these are my favorites, but they really are my favorites. I have a collection of coral bells in my landscape. Um, I have a shady spot that's next to kind of a wood shop area. And, you know, I, I've planted collections because I become fixated on the name of the plant and then decide I need to have every single plant that has a really cool name. So the chick charms with their apple teeny, the same thing for coral bells. So they have cherry cola, and they have peach cobbler, and they have southern comfort, and they have chocolate ruffles. I mean, these are names that just make you drool at the garden center. You just want to buy everything. Um, so I have, and I now have a collection of coral bells. Uh, they do tolerate dry shade, which is nice. And what's really neat about the coral bells is the diversity in colors. So if you look at that bottom picture, you'll see that you have some you know, really dark leaved ones, and you have some that are more lime green, some that are more um, burgundy tones. And so there's just a lot of diversity in the coral bells. The flowers do attract pollinators, which is nice. I've also been told that they're really nice for cut flower bouquets. And so as kind of a filler, a lighter flower, uh, you could cut those and use them in cut flower bouquets. Um, deer and rabbit resistant. So what more could you ask for? Beautiful foliage, really nice flower, um, and short kind of mounded plants. Um, so again, there's a lot of diversity to coral bells. I think you could find one that you like um, or start a collection like me. It's great. Love it. Moving on to anemone. This is also known as windflower. Uh, in general, these are corms. And so similar to uh, some of our fall planted bulbs, you could plant these at the same time, although they do become perennial over time. So you plant it from the corm. You can also buy it in containers as well. Um, but there are differences of when they bloom. So they can bloom in the spring or summer or they can bloom in the fall. So Japanese anemones are going to bloom further on into the fall. So if you love anemones, you can actually kind of time different points of bloom in your garden during the season, but all will take um, those nice shady conditions as well. Uh, flowers tend to be white or pink. Um, there are some blues available, which is always nice because we love blue flowers. And then diversity in plant height. So we have more miniatures of only six inches tall up to 36 inches tall. So again, plan accordingly. Um, this is one that if it you know, gets hit by an irrigation head, or maybe it's on drip irrigation, it doesn't mind additional moisture, but it can certainly do well in drier conditions also. Siberian bugloss, or brunnera, as I generally call it. Uh, brunnera is a great shade plant, and I love it so much because of these periwinkle blooms that it has dancing atop of the foliage. This is a ground cover, so only about 12 inches tall for all of the cultivars, but can spread to two feet wide or more. This is one that if you've ever grown it in other parts of the United States or had grown it in areas with higher moisture, it can become aggressive and kind of a brute. So this is one I would caution you that dry shade really means dry shade. Make sure that you get it established and then water very sparingly from that point on because a lot of these plants can actually get aggressive and then you're kind of in a pickle. 
Um, really large heart-shaped leaves. This is just the plain Brunnera, just the straight species that you have. Uh, but there are some really cool cultivars that have come out. And I believe I have one, yes. Um, this is Alchemy Silver. And if that leaf doesn't make you swoon, I don't know. I mean, I'm just thinking of combinations with coral bells that you could plant and maybe some anemones. Um, and in this case, the flower is a little distracting. I don't love the flower with this super cool foliage um, below, but that's okay. You know, it kind of dances and it almost looks like twinkle lights um, on top of the, the foliage there. So Alchemy Silver was actually in the CSU trials um, and is one of the best ofs that came out of the trials in the last couple of years, um, but such a nice plant. So again, if you have a shady spot that's a little dark and needs some brightening up, those white plants or those plants that have more silver in them are going to be great choices for those spaces. So consider Brunnera as one of those options. And there is a shade tolerant ornamental grass, um, the dwarf blue fescues, there are many on the market. Um, and these are the ones that really look blue. So if you're familiar at all with turf grass, we have fine fescues that we can plant in the turf. Um, so this is another type of fescue. So it's a cousin of our turf species. Um, super cute, really, really small, adorable mounding. Um, this is a great ornamental grass because you really don't have to cut it back in the spring. Um, you could give it a small haircut, but it's a little awkward to prune. Um, so I would just leave it. Um, it doesn't really need any sort of spring pruning um, and very, very tough once established. Um, okay, so for my rabbit friends, this is one that I wouldn't plant um, because rabbits seem to enjoy them. They seem to nest in them and they also seem to chew them. Uh, so not one for rabbits if you have them. Um, although I have rabbits in the backyard and they seem to eat my grass instead of um, my, my blue fescue. Um, there's a lot of different ornamentals out there. Um, featured is Elijah Blue. There's Blue Whiskers. Um, there's another one that I'm, I just blanked on. I'm sorry. Um, but I think it has bunny in its name. So anyway, there's a ton of these and you can plant them kind of in mass. So many in an area. Um, and they look almost like, oh, Sea urchin, that's the name. It's not a rabbit name, but it's called sea urchin. Um, and you can plant these together and they really have great texture, uh, which is nice. So a little bit different texture with the really pokey leaves. Okay, I will pause there. I'm gonna look at the time. Okay, I have a half hour to do trees and shrubs. Um, questions at this point that I can answer. Okay, well, we are getting a lot, so I'll try to keep it brief and then let you finish and we can always get to more at the end if there's if there's more. Um, first of all, thank you all so much for all these great questions. We are getting a lot, so I'm gonna do my best to try to put some together here. Um, a lot of questions about lavender, um, just general pruning suggestions, when to prune it back um, and how to kind of prune back into the non-foliage area and um, the sunlight needs for lavender. So lavender is full sun, um, absolutely full sun, likes that. Um, with pruning, I'm pretty ruthless. So I, I cut it back hard to just, you know, maybe two to three inches. So I am cutting into some of the foliage that's grown. Um, I have found that the lavender I am growing responds well in reliefs during the year. Um, it would depend on the condition of the lavender going into the growing season. So, you know, if it's stressed or maybe it had more winter kill, um, but it is one that I prune back hard and that's what I would recommend is be ruthless. Don't be scared. Um, it should respond. Um, and then if it doesn't happen to make it, you can plant something else. That's <laughs> so much better because I was pretty ruthless last year. Yeah. Um, okay. A lot of questions about switchgrass, um, specifically <laughs> the Northwind switchgrass, annual maintenance, um, do you cut it back and just general pruning tips for that as well and when to know to um, split grasses? Yeah, so um, the ornamental grasses, so both the um, little blue stem and the switchgrass that I talked about, um, you can prune back sometime in the spring. So now through when it starts showing new growth, those are both warm season. And so they're not really going to grow until probably June 1st. So they need a little bit warmer temperatures. Um, with dividing them, yes, you can. I think it's difficult to, so you would dig up the entire clump. And if they have a dead center, you would remove the dead part and then chunk out 
the, the parts that are still living and then replant one of those sections. I think it's difficult to actually get those to reestablish. And so if you have an ornamental grass with a dead center, it might be just something that you dig up and replace with a new ornamental grass instead. Um, but you can do that. But if, if you've never dug up like a clump, whew, it's an effort. It takes some it takes some strength and it will take some effort. So, um, but that's that's the way you would do that. Um, and I do see the comment about bleeding heart. It actually is very low water. Um, again, it's living on moisture that's been given to it um, during the fall and winter. Um, so it has spring moisture in which it blooms and then it goes dormant. So it doesn't need water during those hot summer months. Um, again, it's in an area in my yard that doesn't have any supplemental irrigation and it reliably comes back every year. Oh, awesome. Um, do you have time for one more? Yes. Okay, let's see. Um, I guess a soil question, um, using self soil test kits, or is it better to send it off to be tested at CSU or mail-in testing or what you suggest? Yeah. Um, the, the self test kits don't tell you a lot. And so if you are interested in testing your soil, I would send it to a lab that does that. Um, I would say if you're planting a lot of these plants, soil testing is not going to be super helpful. Um, I would say that if you're going to test your soil, I would focus on the vegetable garden as opposed to your lawn or your landscape. Okay, great. Um, and since I was quick, I'll just give one more here. Um, a hearty <laughs> grass type or ground cover for backyard with a dog. And that's a little tricky. I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that might be a longer, this is the longer, this is a longer answer. So if you get a lot of foot traffic, you're going to want a grass that recovers well from foot traffic. And so two things that you'll probably have to do no matter what you plant, um, water more frequently and then fertilize because you want to stimulate the growth process. Um, in terms of cool season grasses, Kentucky bluegrass is a great option. Perennial ryegrass is great. Um, there are cold hardy Bermuda grasses that you could consider um, for dog traffic. Um, buffalo grass and blue grandma, if you're looking down that route, they can take some traffic, um, but not as much depending on the play that the, the area is getting. So um, that might be one where you could email me and I could maybe um, help okay. you a little more specifically. And that is cool to reach out after the webinar. Um, totally. Great. Because there's so many great questions coming in and I want to, yeah. them, but we will not be able to get to all of them tonight. Absolutely. Please email me. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll let you get back to it. Okay. Thanks. We'll move into shrubs. Um, I think shrubs are kind of the unsung hero of the landscape. They don't get a lot of attention, but they do a lot for us. So let's talk about some of the shrubs that you could plant. These are our woody friends. So a shrub differs from a tree. Um, it may actually be as tall as a tree, but generally it's a plant that has multiple woody stems originating from the base sometimes called a bush. Um, so shrub or bush are interchangeable terms. Um, and for the most part, these are less than 15 feet tall in general. So very general terms, but we have trees that are shrubs and shrubs that are trees. And so it's really hard to kind of generalize uh, this. The first shrub I will talk about is lead plant. Lead plant is a native to Colorado, and I adore this plant. So if you like Russian sage, and Russian sage has a lot of benefits. That's one of the perennials that has these purple flowers that attract pollinators. However, Russian sage is awful because it takes over everything. So I have made this mistake, and I bet some of you have as well. So don't go down that route. If you're thinking, oh, Russian sage would be a great plant for my garden, I would encourage you instead to plant lead plant, which looks very similar, but is so much better behaved than Russian sage could be. This plant is in the pea family. It has these beautiful um, light pink or kind of lavender flowers. Um, the thing with this, that if you plant this, you will think it's dead every year. So May will come by, maybe even early June, and you're looking at this shrub thinking, um, I don't think it made it through the winter. It absolutely did make it through the winter. It's just very, very slow to wake up. So patience with this one. Um, this is a shrub, and I'm going to say this in general with the shrubs I'm going to talk about. These don't want to be pruned. So if you like pruning things or if you feel you need to do maintenance, just really think twice about whether or not you need to prune or if it's just because you have uh, like 
need to do this. So think about whether the plant needs it versus your need. Uh, but for the most part, this is a plant that should be planted accordingly to the size and width and then never pruned. There is a dwarf version uh, that was introduced by Plant Select back in 2020, and it is called, well, it's a Morpha Nana. Nana just means small, um, and it's dwarf lead plant. So the mature lead plant is probably four, four feet, maybe five feet once it really gets established, um, and the dwarf form stays about three feet tall. So there's a bigger version and a smaller version that might fit your bee. The next plant is Blue Mist Spirea. I think this is a plant that everybody should have in their landscape. This is not a true Spirea. Um, so the genus is Caryopteris, uh, but it is Blue Mist Spirea. We would consider this to be a sub shrub. So it's kind of herbaceous, so a little like a perennial, but it's also woody. Um, so we consider it to be a sub shrub. But in terms of a plant that checks all the boxes, pollinator plant, super drought tolerant, really ornamental and attractive, um, looks good in the winter months because the, the flowers themselves kind of dry down and have an ornamental interest. Um, in long bloom time, this is an amazing plant. There's a lot of diversity in blue mist spirea in terms of height and width. So you can get some that are smaller, I know the slide says four by four, but there are actually some introductions that are maybe three by three. And then there are some that are larger, maybe five by five. The way you handle this plant is that it's going to bloom on new growth. So growth that comes out in the spring. So sometime in spring, this time of year, February, April, or February, March, April, you are actually going to cut back this plant by half or two thirds. You are going to remove the entire top of the plant down to like the last half or third of the plant height. So you're going to cut it back pretty severely. Um, but that plant is then going to regrow all of these leaves and then bloom on that new growth. This is just like lavender. Don't be scared. You're going to cut it back. It's going to be fine. Um, but that is how this plant is going to grow. So it does need a significant pruning cut every spring. Um, with this plant. Some of the others I'm talking about will not, but it is a great plant, super xeric, super drought tolerant. Um, so again, a couple of cultivars, the one featured is Dark Knight. Um, first choice, Blue Mist is actually a cultivar. So they all have kind of a purpley flower color, um, but they do range in the shade of purple that they come in, but really a nice plant. And when it's in flower, the bees love it. Just absolutely are all over this plant. They don't care about you because they're too busy pollinating. Um, so it's a wonderful plant. The next shrub is purple smoke bush, um, sometimes called smoke tree because it's a much larger shrub. Um, so it can get up to 10 feet tall, sometimes 12 feet tall, depending on the conditions. What's really amazing about this is that it has a really dark burgundy, burgundy leaf. So during the summer months, um, they come out green and then they turn kind of this chocolatey burgundy color. And then the flowers look like poofs of smoke. So you can see it, it's in full bloom here. Um, just a really interesting texture to the landscape. Um, I have this one planted behind a honey locust in the front of my yard. So it gets significant shade from the honey locust. Again, I don't have irrigation in my landscape beds. And what I noticed initially with the purple smoke bush is that it died back to the ground for probably the first three seasons. And so I worried a little bit about it, but then it came back. And so now it's amazing. Um, it's easily 10 feet tall um, and is just absolutely beautiful. So don't think that you've killed this or don't give up on it. Um, if it does die back to the ground, it just needs a little bit of time to establish. But you will love those flowers on there and you can spot it a mile away, which is really cool. Um, there are green forms that you can consider. Um, they tend to like a little bit more sunlight, um, but the purple type can actually do quite well in the shade. Couple of different pictures, again, really interesting flower texture. 
Rabbit brush is our next shrub. Um, and you may, I think rabbit brush is kind of a love it, hate it. So you'll see it a lot in native areas um, and you'll see it a lot in undisturbed parts um, and natural areas as well. But uh, there are some ornamental features of rabbit brush. So there is an introduction called baby blue. Um, and this is that little guy right here. So it's a it's a dwarf type, so it's not as big as the the regular rabbit brush, which is the one featured on the left or the one you see in native areas. Um, so the full fledged rabbit brush can get to be six by six, um, and a lot of people I don't know it seems to be kind of polarizing actually, um, but it does have a lot of ornamental features, has really nice yellow flowers, um, but I do like this little baby blue, which is only two by two. So a really nice foliage color that kind of bluish so um, would look great with some of the dwarf fescues that are more blue so you could do kind of that angle um, and then it has these yellow blooms and it is a pollinator plant so it's a native it's a pollinator plant um, there's a lot of benefits but this is one that really should never be pruned so do not prune this guy give it the space to grow and just leave it alone um, but super hardy in a lot of different ways a couple other pictures of the rabbit brush. I think this is why people don't like it is it kind of looks unkempt. Um, I get it, I, I understand that. So maybe it needs a special spot in your landscape, but again, um, that little dwarf one is super cute with all those yellow flowers. So anyway, one to consider. The next shrub is Panchito manzanita. Um, I just saw this plant today planted outside a city building in Fort Collins and I stopped and stared for a good long while. Uh, this is a broadleaf evergreen. So this is a plant that actually holds its leaves during um, most of the year and including in the winter and it looked great. Um, absolutely no issues at all. It's going to be more of a ground cover. So only two feet tall, five feet wide, and has really phenomenal pink flowers, really waxy. Um, and then those lead to red fruits. There is a second one called Chieftain, uh, which is just larger. So same characteristics as Panchito. Um, but if Panchito got to be, I'm just going to check, five feet wide, um, Chieftain can get up to eight feet wide. So make sure that, again, you cite this accordingly because pruning should not happen on these guys. Uh, there you can see the pink flowers, which develop into those red fruits, kind of with that dark green glossy foliage, really attractive an amazing plant. Um, this is a wonderful plant and you can see how happy it is growing on rock areas. Moving into nine bark, uh, nine bark has so many different cultivars that there is a nine bark for everybody for their landscape. And so this is where research comes in and checking out cultivars and the shape and size and heights and widths. Um, but what's really cool about nine bark is it has some nice exfoliating bark in the winter. Um, you might think it actually looks diseased or kind of funny, uh, but I would call that exfoliating and a horticultural interest uh, during the winter months. Uh, pink or white flowers in the spring, the foliage is often very attractive. Um, in a lot of the shapes of these nine barks, they can kind of fall. So the first one to show you is summer wine. So dark kind of chocolate burgundy foliage, um, kind of pinky white flowers. But I love the look of that kind of waterfall arching habit of this summer wine. It's, it's a big one. So this is one that's easily eight feet tall and probably eight feet wide. So check the tags and make sure that you have the space for it because you don't want to have to prune it to keep it in its limits. Just let it go. Um, but really, really attractive. And then that exfoliating bark in the winter, um, you know, if you can get it where it's backlit, maybe a little bit by the sun, uh, it could be really attractive during the winter months. The other one is darts gold. And again, there are several, like a dozen or more cultivars that you can consider. I just wanted to show you two. Uh, but the contrast with this one is that those leaves truly are chartreuse. Uh, people might say, wow, that looks really chlorotic or it doesn't look very healthy, uh, but that's actually the leaf color of this darts gold. And you can see how it has a white flower. So you can do the dark chocolate, you could do uh, the more, um, lighter yellow color and then there's everything in between including um, just normal greens but really attractive and, and nine bark can fit a lot of places and kind of fill a large space which is really nice 
Uh, one viburnum to call to your attention. Viburnums are great. There's actually many different types that you could plant. Um, Mohican is a big one, uh, but there are smaller ones like uh, Korean spice viburnum, which have an incredible fragrance. Uh, they're much smaller, but we'll talk about Mohican um, just because it has one of the best fruit sets of all of the viburnums. And so that's what it's really great about a lot of our shrubs is that they have interesting flowers that then develop into fruits, which can support uh, wildlife like birds and other animals. Um, and then a lot of times our shrubs are also going to have some nice fall color. So Mohican has all of those things, flowers, fruits, and then nice fall color. This is one that can take more shade. Uh, so if you have a shady spot, um, just again, make sure that you do have the space for it. So height and width of at least eight feet. Um, I have seen them up to 10 if they're in a very happy location. Um, so not one that you wanna cram into a small little corner. Um, but again, that fall color is nice. So looking at some of the ground covers that we talked about, the ornamental grasses and then our shrubs can give us that seasonal display, which is really nice. Utah serviceberry is a native, um, which makes sense because it, it hails from Utah and it also has uh, grown into Colorado. So this is another large native shrub. Um, heights of up to uh, 12 to 15 feet. So this would border on a small tree. Uh, we would consider it a shrub because it does, again, have those multiple branches coming out of the base. Um, serviceberry and the tree serviceberries, all of these plants, these amelanchers, uh, really do have so much appeal. So they're going to bloom in May and June. So very early in the spring, the flowers develop into edible fruits, which tastes a lot like a blueberry. I will tell you that you'll get very little fruit because the birds will get them first. And so uh, you'll be fighting the birds in order to eat the fruits, but the fruits are edible, which is really great. And then a lot of the newer cultivars, especially on the tree side, actually have really nice fall color as well. Um, so a great ornamental tree, a large shrub, whatever you want to call it, kind of a, a crossover, um, and then hardy up to 9,000 feet. So you could grow this into Estes and Vale and some of those areas. And it's another nice one because it does well um, in full sun to part shade. Uh, so this is actually taken at the Cheyenne Botanic Garden. So even further north than Fort Collins, um, we know the wind situation that happens in Cheyenne. And so this is a nice shrub for that area. So again, Utah service berry is one to consider. And then we'll wrap up with just a few trees. The time. Okay, I'll get through this. Uh, so a couple trees to, to throw your way, a couple ornamentals. The first is Japanese tree lilac. This is a syringa. So very similar to our shrub lilacs. Um, the bloom is later. So it blooms more into June. Um, and it has a different fragrance. So it's not that super sweet, delicious shrub lilac smell, but it does have a fragrance that's quite nice. Um, Japanese tree lilac is pretty great. It's about 30 feet tall, 25 feet wide, very rounded. Um, it can get exfoliating bark as it starts to mature, which is really nice. So it can get kind of like shredded bark, almost like a birch. If you're familiar with birch, how it gets kind of that peeling bark on there. Um, it does have yellow foliage, so not great in the fall. Um, but the flowers, which are really, really ornamental and really attractive, um, kind of fade into these really interesting seed heads that do persist through the winter months. Um, and that's really great. So Japanese tree lilac can be grown as a single stem, like a true tree, or you might see it as a multi-stem, which looks more like a shrub. So you might find it in both cases. Um, ivory silk is a really common cultivar that you will be able to find. Um, and there's a couple others out there, but really a lot of appeal, really cold tolerant as well, which is nice. Sucker Prince Choke Cherry. So before you poo poo me because it's a choke cherry, hear me out. Uh, choke Cherry is a great tree, super tolerant, um, lots of ornamental features. The problem with the regular choke cherry is that it suckers like you wouldn't believe. So at the base, it gets all of those suckers, plus it can consider to be weedy because the birds eat the fruit, then they drop the fruits in their, their waste, and then those grow into new choke cherries. So a lot of people have kind of disregarded choke cherry. Um, I will say the sucker punch is 
has all the good characteristics that you want in choke cherry and none of the bad. Uh, so it gets to be about 20 feet tall, 20 feet wide. It is suckerless. Um, so at the base, it doesn't get those crazy suckers coming up. Um, it is suckerless. This was actually the tree um, at Fort Collins Wholesale Nursery where this was um, originally propagated from. And it grew like this for, this is, This tree is probably 20, 30 years old and it's never had a sucker at the base. Um, great white flowers, really nice attractive fruits, um, really dark red, kind of a burgundy leaf color during the summer months. And so this is a great tree, super tolerant to drought in a lot of our different conditions. Um, beautiful white flowers that are very attractive to pollinators. And then the fruits are green that turn that dark, purple color. Um, birds love it. And again, it doesn't seem to be a nuisance. So Sucker Punch Choke Cherry is pretty available on the market. So that is one that you could consider. Kentucky Coffee Tree is another. This is a larger shade tree. So we're kind of moving from smaller trees into the bigger ones. Um, Kentucky Coffee Tree is one that you really need to have some patience. So give it five to seven years to get established and actually form into a tree, but it's absolutely worth it. So beautiful crown. Um, they have a few different cultivars out there. I love the seed pod. So it's a dark, chunky seed pod. And what's cool about Kentucky coffee tree is during the fall and winter, the seed pods remain on the tree. And then the branches itself are really stout and kind of chunky. So on a moonlit night in October, you'll have the chunky seed pods and then these kind of stout branches. It's the perfect Halloween tree. It's just beautiful. But I know that seed pods aren't everyone's favorite thing. And so there are podless types available. So espresso, decaf, and skinny latte. Love the names. Um, those are all podless types. And skinny latte is actually a columnar form uh, that you might consider. But this is what you get when you plant Kentucky coffee tree. And you're looking at this with a raised eyebrow and judging this poor little tree and saying, I don't know. Again, give it five to seven years and you will have an amazing tree. These are probably 20 to 30 years old. Um, but even after 10 years, this tree is worth the wait. So um, don't judge a book by its cover um, and give Kentucky coffee tree a chance. I have to talk about Ohio Buckeye. Um, I went to Ohio State, so very proud to be a Buckeye. Um, but this is a great ornamental, um, larger shade tree for Colorado, only about 35 feet tall, maybe 40. Um, but it doesn't tend to get as big as it does in the Midwest or on the East Coast. Uh, a very rounded form, which is really nice. I have a couple pictures of what this looks like. So you can see kind of the rounded canopy um, of the Ohio Buckeye. But the reason we plant this tree is because of these incredible flowers. So they are upright in the tree. They're tropical. They come out in late May and June. And then they form into those cool pods that then contains the buckeye nut. Um, so if you've ever had a candy buckeye with the peanut butter and chocolate version, they look like that. But the nut on this tree is poisonous to humans. So please don't eat it. Um, but squirrels absolutely love them. Squirrels will hoard all of the nuts and bury them in the yard uh, to eat later, and you will never see them for the most part. Uh, there's a great cultivar coming out. Um, there's a couple. So one is the Autumn Splendor. This is actually a cross between the Ohio Buckeye and another species, um, but it was selected because of its amazing fall color. Um, really kind of the reds and oranges that some of us miss when we grew up in the Midwest. Um, and then there's another species called the Jim Clett Ohio Buckeye. Dr. Clett was our professor of ornamental horticulture for 43 years at CSU. And when you have a four decade career in horticulture, you get a tree named after you. So Dr. Clett is also a proud Ohio uh, Buckeye. And so he has this tree named after him. Uh, not quite on the market yet, so give it some time, but it will be introduced by the Plant Select Program, um, and it should be available in the next few years, but selected specifically for its hardiness, and then also this incredible fall color that you can see on display. For an oak, you could consider Schumard oak. Um, 
just want to check the time. Okay, we're, um, Schumard oak is great. It's a native tree to the Midwest, but it really has become adaptable to Colorado and our conditions. Um, the leaves are more like a red oak, so they have those sharp points. Um, and fall color can actually be really pretty spectacular. It can have some nice reds on there. It's going to vary depending on the fall that we have. So areas with more moisture, and when we get more moisture, it's going to have better fall color, but sometimes it can be more brown, um, but again, could fit the bill. And a lot of the oaks are not slow growing, so please, don't think of that. It's a total myth. They can grow eight to 10 inches a year. Um, and a lot of the oaks do very well in our high pH. Hackberry, just a tough, reliable tree. Um, does get nipple gall on the leaves, so those little bumps on the leaves, which is not super attractive. But if you have a tough time growing trees or don't have a lot of water after establishment, hackberry is the tree for you. Can tolerate super drought, can tolerate wind, um, and this is the tree you'd plant on the back 40 to have some shade, um, but not a lot of ornamental features. But in terms of a tolerant tree, hackberry fits the bill. Um, okay, evergreens, I just have a couple. The first is bristlecone pine. This is a Colorado native. Um, it is a five needle pine, very, very slow growing and kind of looks like, you know, um, shaggy or snuffleupagus from the Muppets. It kind of has that different form. Um, this is one you can find up to 11,000 feet, so high up in the mountains. Um, not one that wants a lot of supplemental moisture. And just be very patient because it grows so slowly, like just maybe a couple inches of growth um, each year. Uh, pinion pine, oops, I didn't mean to skip that. Pinion pine is another native. Uh, this is one that would not fare well in a lawn situation. So this is one that needs to be in a more uh, xeric or non-watered situation. Um, of course, we get pinion nuts from this tree. Um, having one tree in your landscape won't be enough to make pesto. You'll need many, many pinions in order to do that. Um, another one that's very slow growing and very drought tolerant. And then junipers, I mean, we give junipers a bad rap, but junipers really are pretty incredible. Very, very tolerant to a lot of conditions. And the diversity of junipers should be celebrated. So we have trees, we have things like woodward juniper, which is super skinny and 20 feet tall. And then of course we have more the ground cover junipers. But in terms of tolerance to cold and drought in various conditions, uh, junipers really do fit the bill. And there's a lot of diversity too with the color. Some are more gray, some are more green. Um, so really don't, don't just overlook junipers, but do give them the space they need to grow uh, properly. One last thing, next week, March 13th, my colleague Darren Davidson, who has also done a number of WaterWise classes with Resource Central, uh, will be doing an update on some of the legislation that has come through Colorado. You can scan that QR code. We ask that you register. Uh, just like this webinar, it will be recorded and then posted on the cohorts blog. Just search for that term. Um, but you'll be doing that one hour noontime webinar next Wednesday, March 13th. And again, it will be recorded if you can't make it. And with that, my time is up. There is my final slide. There's my email address because I know there's lots of questions that we didn't get to. Uh, but thank you for joining me and I'll talk soon. Pass it back to Melanie. Awesome, Allison, that was amazing. You covered so much, and oh. yeah, <laughs> deep breath. That was absolutely incredible. Um, we got so many good questions. So again, definitely encourage anyone who did not get their question answered um, to reach out directly. Um, and as a reminder, we will be sending the slides as well as the webinar. Um, that was just awesome. So thank you, Allison, for the time and just for all of your knowledge. And thank you to the city of Arvada for making this happen. Um, I also want to just put a plug that these seminars will continue all the way through August. So definitely take a look at the schedule and feel free to sign up for as many or as few as you'd like. But there's a wide array of topics. We have Firewise landscaping this year, um, lots of fantastic topics. Um, and also after tonight, when you, when you close the webinar, you will have an opportunity to fill out our survey. We'll also send the survey out in the email tomorrow. Um, so definitely take a moment to tell us what you thought. We got some fantastic comments from people as well, and I'll be passing those along to the team um, as well as leaving that in the survey. 
Um, and then do want to mention again that Garden in a Box is on sale now. Thank you, Allison, for the plug. Um, they do sell pretty quickly, so I encourage taking a look. Uh, there's plant lists and information about um, different rabbit and deer resistant water needs. All of that is um, available on our website and they are on sale now. So um, I think with that, we will end. But again, fantastic questions. And please reach out directly to Allison um, for any follow up. So thank you so much. Thanks, everybody.